enforcement. Coronavirus cases are still on the rise as schools prepare to open this fall. Congress has been in a stalemate over the next COVID-19 relief bill for weeks. Let's bring in Texas Congressman Brian Babin. Congressman, thank you for joining us again. Welcome back to the show. Why do these talks keep falling apart, sir? Simply because the Democrats do not want uh, to cooperate. Uh, I think uh, you don't have to be a genius to see that as long as the economy is shut, shut down and uh, we're locked into a recession and high unemployment, uh, that, that uh, they, their chances of winning in November are better. Uh, I think it's just a simple fact uh, that they don't want to uh, cooperate. They, uh, they hijack each and every COVID uh, relief bill that we have. Uh, they want to up with things like sanctuary city money, stimulus checks for illegal aliens, Green New Deal provisions, uh, you know, relief for the pot and marijuana industry. It's incredible. Uh, these are the things that they're trying to push, and uh, we want to get the money to where it needs to go, and that is to the hard uh, working people that are out of work, people that are not, not able to get their kids back in school, and we've got to get this economy and this country marching on again. Congressman, weigh in on this phenomenon that I find just baffling. President Trump announced a payroll tax holiday tax cut tax delay, whatever you, whatever term you want to look at. He says he'll he'll excuse all payroll taxes if he's reelected. Whatever, it's a payroll tax holiday. It's good for consumers. It's good for the worker. It's good for uh, employers. The Democrats came out and said, "Oh, how he can't do that? That's going to be dipping into Social Security." Here's what I don't get: five years ago, President Obama recommended the same exact idea, the same thing, a payroll tax cut. And there wasn't a peep from Democrats mentioning Social Security whatsoever. <laughs> Eric, it's, it's, it's the hypocrisy of the left. Uh, they absolutely blame us for everything they've been doing. Uh, I, I think if you look historically, you can see that uh, everything they accuse us of, they've already done. Uh, and and uh, doesn't say that we're doing it, uh, but everything they do accuse us of, hey, it's it's already a, a done deal, and, and so uh, they just simply want these inane practices and policies abolishing the uh, police departments across the country, uh, you know, uh, uh, keeping the police departments that are in uh, in service and keeping them away from where the riots are taking place, and uh, you can see that folks are leaving New York City and. And uh, and Portland and and, and uh, uh, Chicago and different different uh, uh, blue cities in droves. They're they're leaving. They're not going to put up with this uh, and not have police protection. And and ironically, uh, Eric, this is where they've got the, the fewest uh, constitutional rights to be able to keep and bear firearms. Right, right, S sir, sir. No police protection. I don't mean something. I don't mean to cut you off because I, I I sat down with President Trump and he mentioned that. A lot of the violence in these cities, it's clear, are these are Democrat cities, and they've been Democrat cities for a very That's long right. time. Bill Barr, the attorney general, had this to say. Take a listen. I have to believe that, uh, that our agencies and so forth are really trying to construct some kind of scenario about what we're dealing with and how to undo this. Am I close? It's a form of, of sort of, it's a new form of urban guerrilla warfare. So that, that's disturbing, you know, a new form of urban guerrilla warfare. It, you know, however you describe it, is this a new America? I mean, this is what we have to go look forward to going forward. Let's hope not. I think the tale will be told November the 3rd that evening. Uh, because I don't think a greater country two parties in the history of our nation. Uh, if we go with the Democrats, open borders, loss of uh, your Second Amendment, gun rights, uh, high taxes, uh, super regulation coming back in, uh, you, you're going to have unlimited, unlimited uh, immigration from all parts of the world, whether they're illegal. And uh, these are the types of things we can expect, rather than economic freedom and liberties that we've all enjoyed under our great republic. I got about 30 seconds or so. Speaking of, of uh, immigration, uh, Kamala Harris, the new VP pick, has uh, called ICE agents, uh, compared them to the KKK. Now, Congressman from Texas, you have a border wall with Mexico. What do you say to her? I got 30 seconds. All you. She's completely out to lunch. Uh, uh, that 
congestion is, is just asinine. Uh, we, uh, the, the president is doing a great job building the wall. This was his uh, 2016 promise. Uh, 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 he's border is so much more secure today than it, than it has been. I'm the, the House Border Security Caucus uh, co-chairman. I've been down there a number of times. Things are so much better today than they have been. Uh, and if she gets in there, absolute disaster for our country. Right, and I think the, uh, the, the American people can sense that. We're going to leave it right there. Thank you again, Congressman from Texas, Brian Babin. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. This week, presidential candidate Joe Biden announced that California Senator Kamala Harris is his running mate in the upcoming election. Scott Thuman, Sinclair's national correspondent, has more on what to expect from the ticket. The unveiling of the now full ticket of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris previewed two points the duo is likely to harp on. The idea of a better tomorrow. This election isn't just about defeating Donald Trump or Mike Pence. It's about building this country back better. And using Harris's background as a prosecutor to go after President Trump full bore. The case against Donald Trump and Mike Pence is open and shut. More than 16 million out of work. Millions of kids who cannot go back to school. Look, he made a choice, he picked her. I watched her. I watched her poll numbers go boom, 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 down to almost nothing. And now she's running as vice president. So how does that work? Democrats say while policy and persona obviously matter, it was about chemistry as much as anything else. All he needed to do was to resolve the problem of what he calls simpatico. I think I'll agree with Barack Obama that he nailed it. As well known as Harris may be in D.C. circles, her voting record and resume will now face new levels of scrutiny. Though Biden doing his best to convince voters she is exactly what the country needs. Worried about whether or not she'll have a job to go to whether or not you'll be able to pay your mortgage, pay your rent, worried about your civil rights, even your basic right to dignity. Kamala Harris has had your back, and now we have to have her back. In Washington, Scott Thuman, America This Week. Thank you, Scott. Ahead on America This Week United, we stand with the election only three months away and the coronavirus in full swing. Will in-person voting be safe? You don't want to miss my conversation with pandemic expert, Dr. Dina Grayson, text. United we stand, we never fall. This perilous fight, it takes one and all. Everyone stands, American strong. Strength by one equals strength by all. As the nation continues to grapple with the coronavirus pandemic, two fall activities are raising safety concerns. Now think about this, folks, the reopening of schools and in-person voting. Joining me now to discuss is pandemic expert D Dina, Dr. Dina Grayson. Sorry about that, doctor. Um, so, okay, which one is it? is it? Is it safe to go to school and is it safe to go vote? Which one are safe, which one isn't, and why are they different? Well, one size doesn't fit all, Eric. I mean, as we know that this pandemic has been spreading throughout the country, first starting on our coasts, especially in New York State and New York City. And now what we're seeing is really the nation's heartland that's become um, really the epicenter, along with, of course, my home state here in Florida, uh, Texas and California. So it really depends on where you live. And the bottom line is, Eric, is if you live in a community where there is active, ongoing community spread of this deadly virus, it is a very bad idea to reopen schools. I mean, you can just ask Israel. 
Uh, Israel has one of the largest outbreaks in the entire world just from reopening one school in Jerusalem. So, and so that virus spread like wildfire. Doc, here's, what, here's the point I'm trying to make. There, there are people, there are, I don't want to make this, this political, but I, I, it, to a certain extent, I think it is. There, there are areas, states, let's take states, for example, where they're saying schools should open because it's time to open schools. But mail-in voting needs to be the thing because it's too dangerous to go vote. Can they... Can these two ideas live in the same state? Well, again, it depends on specifically where you are in that state. But in general, Eric, schools we know, you're packing kids in uh, closely together. Um, a lot of public schools, they can't do that social distancing because they don't have the physical space. And you're having kids in a classroom all day next to one another. Depending on where you vote, it may well be you go in and you're wearing your mask and I know you're a good mask wearer and you're able to vote and leave very quickly. That would be a relatively low risk thing to do, sort of like going to the grocery store. But if you have to stand in line for six hours next to that same person who happens to be infected, that could be a much higher risk Bad activity. Idea. If you're Bad idea. But there's good news because finally the world has a vaccine for the virus. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so uh, Vladimir Putin says, and if you believe what Vladimir Putin says, then, you know, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. So what Russia has done essentially is said, OK, we're going to go ahead and approve our vaccine, maybe at sort of the same stage we're at here in this country. And I say maybe sort of. I mean, Russia is not known uh, for their world expertise in developing new treatments and vaccines. But what they have done is accelerate um, and just based upon very minimal data, and I, I should put data sort of in quotes here because no one has actually seen the data outside of the very few researchers on Putin's payroll. So I, I think a lot of us look at this with a lot of skepticism and certainly um, have a lot of concerns about potential safety now that this vaccine is going to supposedly be right. used out in the wild with really no other testing or monitoring of these um, unsuspecting patients. A couple of uh, very obvious observations. Number one, you see that little graphic we had flying around there. That was pretty cool. I guess uh, this is Sputnik <laughs> for a vaccine. Number two, don't don't take anything that comes out of Russia until it's been very no. much tested. I have to stay away from that for a while. And number three, don't even drink Russian vodka because it's not even that good. <laughs> Doctor, <No. laughs> um, over the last week or so, there's a big motorcycle gathering in, in uh, Sturgis, uh, South Dakota. Do you think this will be one of those super spreader events? Uh, well, Eric, I think that a lot of us, uh, you know, in the medical community have a ton of concern about this. Um, I think one of the saving graces is that a lot of times motorcyclists, of course, out and about, they're on their own motorcycle. Again, relatively low, low risk. It's then once they go to those bars, and we know that bars, just like schools, and unfortunately, um, you know, churches and other areas of religious worship, these tend to be places where outbreaks spring up. And that's really the concern. We're going to have people from all over the country gathering in one place, I'm assuming that many of these people, unfortunately, will not be mask wearers. And then if they're now indoors in bars where they're shouting and in each other's faces, um, this is really setting up for a nightmare situation. Literally 30 seconds, Doc. I got to just got to cut you to 30. Um, the SEC has decided they hasn't decided whether they're going to play football or not. The Big Ten and the Pac-12 said now are our, 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 our kids, our students at risk by, by playing college football. Well, I mean, imagine being a lineman. I'm a, I'm a Florida Gator, so go Gators. And as much as we all love our college sports, I think that it is extremely unwise right now to be putting players along with coaching staff and, uh, you know, in at risk for this virus. It's just not the right time. As always, the sensible person in the room, because I want to see football. I just I just need to see some <laughs> SEC. I got to see Alabama. I got to see my, 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 my uh, Clemson Tigers. <laughs> Defender Championship. Dr. Dean Grayson, thank you so much as always. Thanks for having me, Eric. Coming up on America This Week, United We Stand, a heated debate between our panel of experts. You don't want to miss this. A couple of weeks ago, I brought you to the California-Mexico border where, while our cameras were rolling, a major meth bust went down. Next week, I'm headed to Kentucky where illegal grow fields pop up, get this, on U.S. parklands. We'll show you how U.S. drug enforcement eradicates a field by torching it. 
I want to remind you why I'm so involved in busting open illegal drug rings operating in plain sight in our backyards. I'll bring you never before seen footage behind the scenes of the real war on drugs. Dope Inc., I call it. It's big business and it's killing thousands of our beautiful children every week. Go to the foundation I set up in my son's name, see what we're doing. Join me in fighting for our children. EricChaseFoundation.org, right there. United we stand, we never fall. This perilous fight, it takes one and all. Everyone stands, American strong, strength by one equals strength by all. American values, American pride, your neighbor needs you, each person, each time. We stand American strong. United we stand. America This Week, America's fastest growing political show, points out how rough and tumble politics shape opinion in every region in our country. We tell American stories, stories that touch our people, determine our politics, focus on the future of America. I'm Eric Bowling. Join me for a fascinating look at America this week. All right. Keep you. That's all right. You ready to go to work? Oh my God. I'm so ready to go to work. This week, presidential candidate Joe Biden, oh, isn't that cute? He announced his running mate. Senator Kamala Harris will be his uh, running mate. Will this be a big bump for Team Biden? Joining me to discuss is our panel Democratic strategist Kelly Hyman, University of Maryland lecturer Dr. Jason Nichols, and Republican strategist Julio. Rivera, Jason, I, uh, that brought a tear to my eye. Oh, wasn't that cute how he like he messaged her on his laptop and they, she pretended that she didn't know the call was coming. Uh, what do you think of the pick, Jason? Uh, I think it's a decent pick. It's the one that made sense. Uh, while I may agree with some other uh, of the finalists more uh, politically, I think that uh, Kamala Harris was the best pick for Joe Biden. She's somebody who agrees with him on many issues. Uh, they've even had a dust up, which I actually think is a, a, a strength for both of them, shows that they can patch things up, that they can disagree, that they can go into the war room and speak and talk I, I, things Jason, out. Are you, are you concerned about her record with African Americans, specifically the way she prosecuted certain crimes that people will say were biased against African Americans in California? Uh, actually, I'm not. I think that, you know, it's been a long time since that's a lot of that has happened. I think she's evolved a lot. Uh, I think if we start pointing to what people have done many years ago, we can start going back many years with Donald Trump and talk about many of the things he's done. But we can talk about things with regard to criminal justice uh, issues that Donald Trump is doing presently that I think trouble a lot of African-Americans. So I think they're going to side largely with Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. Uh, Holdio, what do you think of this pick? I think it's ridiculous. First off, um, they should have went with somebody who is a true moderate. You know, Kamala Harris, they're going to try to repackage her as this pragmatic moderate. But the 
fact of the matter is that she is an extreme leftist from California, a tax and spend politician. She's somebody, as it's been pointed out by many, has prosecuted more African Americans for nonviolent crimes than any other attorney general in California history. I think that that's going to play against her. I think her attacks on Joe Biden as recently as this past primary are going to play against the ticket as a whole. They should have went with somebody from the Midwest, from the Rust Belt, somebody that appeals to working class blue collar Democrats in the middle of the country. Kelly, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, during, um, I guess in, in the lead up to this, Joe Biden was under some scrutiny from Tara Reid, who accused him of sexual harassment. Kamala Harris said she believes Joe Biden's accuser. How does this play out with women the Me Too movement even going forward? You know, I think that's an interesting question, but I, I think that they came together. I mean, you know, it's interesting from a standpoint, if a man came out and said something, some of the comments that she made, that they say that, oh, that he's being strong. But when a woman comes out and does that, it, it's against her. And it's in some way, you know, sexism. I mean, she ran for office and now she's the VP. I think she's going to do a great job. And I mean, disagree with a lot of stuff that, you know, he said, I think, Biden did a great pick, well, a majority. Well, Kelly, may, yeah. may, can I just stay on this for a second? It, either Absolutely. Tara Reid is to be believed and Biden harassed her sexually, or she's not. But Kamala Harris said she believes Tara Reid. So I, I, can you can you walk that back? You know, I, I think, you know, that's ultimately what she decides on. If she said that, you know, made that statement. But, you know, she did believe her. Um, but, you know, it's all politics. And, and, you know, we're distracting and talking about the issue when we should be talking about the true issue of what's going on in this country, how our unemployment rate is the worst it's been since the Great Depression. And we have a, over 150,000 people dead because of coronavirus on Trump's watch. Mm -hmm. That's 1,000 people right. a day. That's why Americans need change. I, I want to ask my, my control room to play the diversity clip of Joe Biden, which kind of rocked a lot of people when they heard that go. And by the way, what you all know, but most people don't know, unlike the African-American community, with notable exceptions, the Latino community is an incredibly diverse community with incredibly different attitudes about different things. Jason? Well, again, it's kind of on brand for Joe Biden to use clunky language, but largely, uh, and this may be unpopular with some of your viewers, but I largely agree with him. Number one, Latino communities are diverse racially. You know, you can be a black Latino, you can be a white Latino, you can be someone who uh, doesn't really identify with either race. You can be an Asian, Amer you know, an Asian Latino. So I think uh, they are diverse, more diverse racially. Um, okay, what about, the, what, about, what about the other half of the statement? What about the other half where he said, unlike the black community, is there no diversity yeah. in the black community? I do think that there that he used clunky language, but when, when what I think he was mainly getting at is that in the last election, 90% of African Americans voted with Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party. If you go back to 2008, 94% of African Americans voted with the Democratic Party. They we are a unified uh, political special interest group, and I think that that's not an insult to say. Latinos, right. on the other hand, when you look at 28% uh, of them went with Donald Trump right. and the rest right. went with Hillary Clinton. So you had more diversity in let terms. Me, let, me get Julio, let me get Julio in. Do you agree with uh, Joe Biden? Hey, listen, uh, first off, I feel bad for Jason and his colleagues. They're going to be doing a lot of spinning for all of the uh, off-color and clunky comments that Joe Biden is going to be making. But no, there is a lot of diversity of thought and a lot of diversity of race. You know, uh, and I have to kind of agree with what Jason said there to a certain extent. Um, but the fact of the matter is that Joe Biden, to be talking about race, the guy that said that he didn't want his kids to grow up in a racial jungle when the issue of segregation came up and his, his checkered past with issues like segregation and busing. Right. This is not a guy that's going to bring the country together racially. Ke Ke Kelly, um, I don't have a lot of time, just 30 seconds or so. I, there seems to be a lot of cleanup on aisle five with, with, with everyone on the left, with, with, uh, almost weekly with what something Joe Biden says. Well, you know, I would disagree with that. And, and going back to Kamala Harris, she is not leftist. She is a moderate. And according to a recent poll, the majority of uh, Republicans support her in comparison to Biden. So I think that they're going to win in 2020.
All right, we'll leave it there because Kelly is so good at answering a different question from the one I asked, but she knows I'm just about out of time. Kelly Hyman, Jason Nichols. Next we time. Back. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Look, we'd hate for you to miss a minute of America This Week or United We Stand. Remember to set your DVR so you don't miss a thing. Go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash America Bowling, all one word, and find out when we air in your city. United we stand, we never fall. This perilous fight, it takes one and all. Everyone stands, American strong. Strength by one equals strength by all. Want to watch United We Stand on the go? Download the STIR app straight to your smartphone. It's 100% free TV. It's streaming 24-7. United We Stand airs every Sunday at 6.30 a.m. Get up early or stay up late. Watch the show 6.30 a.m. on your local STIR City channel, channel number one. You can watch on your smartphone or on Roku, on your TV, and Apple TV. Plus, you can check out all of our best interviews on the app Every show is at your fingertips and always 100% free. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of America This Week United We Stand. Viewers from across the country have been sending in their home videos to their local stations via Chime In. Here's a video sent to Portland Station KATU. Corey Veal's brave dachshund pups defended their backyard against the black bear. The video was caught on a home security camera where you can see Vale's dogs chase the bears out of the yard. Those Portland dogs deserve all the treats for being a good boy and a good girl. Have a great night and see everyone next week.